You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Boris Bouya. In this week's program, we interview Emilia Eriksson from Swedish Humanist Association on children's autonomy from religion and the parents' religion. Mm, a really wonderful interview. We'll also be talking about the imprisonment of Nazanin Ratcliffe who went to visit her family in Iran. We'll talk about ISIS and one of, some of the things that they're doing in Iraq, including a bombing, that's three bombings that's taken the lives of nearly 100 people. We'll talk about a refugee mother living in Sheffield who's given a video message to the Home Secretary in Britain and uh, a fatwa, an insane fatwa, of course, Crazy against one. emoticons. And finally, our slice of life is about a mock wedding for a Baha'i mother who's been in prison for the past eight years. Don't go away. You're going to like this program. You better like this program. Stay with us. In the news that passed this week, one of the things that has caught our attention is, of course, the arrest of Nazanin Zakari Ratcliffe. Now, she's a British Iranian who went to visit her family. And when she was leaving Iran with her 22-month-old baby, who's a British citizen born in Britain, Gabriella, she was arrested at the airport. She was basically uh, taken to prison. She's been in solitary confinement, hasn't been able to see a lawyer or her family until just the 11th of May, where she was allowed to see her uh, almost two-year-old for a few hours over lunch. So yeah. it's just outrageous. She's been not even charged, but it's basically because of national security issues. Yes, and they've actually kept her in a prison about a thousand miles away from Tehran, where the family are. Um, and also, there's so many layers in this uh, arrest. First of all, the Islamic Republic of Iran takes hostage effectively, is, is engaged in hostage taking of Iranian um, dual English nationalities, dual nationalities yeah. English or yeah. Americans. They take them hostage to use them as a bargaining chip. Mm -hmm. With the, uh, with the different countries. And also and it's a bogus charges, I mean, national absolutely. security. And everybody Ridiculous. knows, everybody knows that actually these are trumped up charges. And, uh, you know, confessions which are made up and forced uh, out of people. And later on, every, everybody who comes out of those prisons, they actually show to the world that actually this is an oppressive, repressive religious government who has no respect for any human life. I mean, the way they've treated the child. Yeah, they've taken, I mean, the passport of a British citizen away. The child. <coughs> the, the child. child's passport, yeah. And imagine the 22-month-old the child. I mean, I think about when my child was 22. You know, she's come to a foreign country with her mom. Uh, she's just met her grandparents, most likely, yeah. you know, and now she's living with them and she hadn't seen her mom for more than a month until just recently. Now, there's a petition you can sign. Lots of people have signed onto this petition, which is great, which might be why they allowed her to meet with her daughter and her parents over lunch. Yeah. But this reminds me of another case from Iran, that of uh, Amir Hekmati. He was kept in prison for four years in Iran. Mm -hmm. He was actually first sentenced uh, to the death penalty, then it became 10 years in prison, and he was uh, recently released in a prisoner swap. And of course, he's uh, done a brilliant thing, and he's taken the Iranian regime to court for all the tortures that he faced while he was in Iran. And actually the stories he tells about the way he was treated in the Iranian prison says a volume about the way, what the nature of this uh, regime and Islamic Republic of uh, Iran. So it hasn't changed all these deals and wheeling supposedly hasn't improved anything in Iran and I think people should take note of this. Mm. The other issue is that a couple of uh, the uh, members of parliament in yeah. Iran They've come out and said, look, what is he complaining about? Well, he should be pleased that we've let him go. Now he's gone outside, he's complaining no, he's, about No, he's taking advantage of Iran's goodwill. 
Uh, yeah, you know, very nice of them to keep him in prison for four and years torture and torture the hell out of him. Yeah, yeah. And another one said that he should apologize. I mean, I, I didn't realize you need to apologize for being tortured. And this is a topsy turvy <laughs> word of the Mullahs and Islamists. That's and of course, you know, Iran is uh, supposedly, you know, the reformists in power. Um, yada, yada, yada. They're Not. all the same. Exactly. But we, we let's go now to ISIS in Iraq. You know, they've taken responsibility for three separate bombs that took place in Baghdad just recently. We should all be saying Je suis Baghdad. We have to remember that, you know, what they do in Paris and Brussels is exactly what they do every day in the Middle East and, and that's Africa. the nature of the Islamist movement. It doesn't matter where they are, whether they are in Bangladesh, whether they are in Iran in power, whether they're in Iraq, whether they're Iran, they are in Syria or anywhere they have the power in Europe. That's the method, that's the way they try to sort of have influence by terror and murder. That's the nature of the Islamist movement. Yeah, and they've attacked, uh, they've done a car bomb in a mosque, they've attacked a Shia neighborhood, and they've attacked a Sunni neighborhood. And of course, nearly, uh, I think, 100 people have been killed in just one day in Baghdad. It is outrageous, really. And you hear about other atrocities that they've committed. I can't even utter this next thing that they've done, yeah. because it's just so... Heartbreaking, but they have executed a seven-year-old boy because he cursed the divinities while he was playing football with his friends. What can and you say? What can what, you, what say, can about you say about that? Seriously, and uh, you know, you read reports about his name is uh, Moaz Hassan. We should never ever forget his name. And his parents, um, uh, they were sobbing, uh, they fainted when they, they shot him. And they said that he's insulted the Khalifa. It doesn't matter how old he is, he needs to pay the price. And of course, you've heard reports also of them burying alive uh, jihadi members of their own group who don't want to fight anymore. I mean, they have no mercy for anyone, do and they? And this is interesting because a lot of the people who uh, originally possibly join them, but were forced, a lot of people were forced in uh, Iraq and Syria to join them now, they try, they've tried to escape, they try to seek sanctuary, or they've said they're not, they're refusing to abide by the murderous methods, they are burying them alive. Yeah, this this movement yeah. has no mercy on anyone. Well, uh, you know, if, if you can actually shoot a seven-year-old boy yeah. in a public square, I'm not sure what else, you know, th that I think is the height of... Yeah terror and horror, really. Yeah. Um, now let's go to refugees, refugees who are, by the way, fleeing uh, ISIS, fleeing the Assad regime, fleeing the Iranian regime, and so on and so forth. Their plight is, you know, heartbreaking. But there's this video that this mother's done. Her name is Amal Alwadi. She Al has uh, joined Al her husband and two younger children in Sheffield. They are refugees here. However, they haven't been able to be reunited with their older children because of the immigration rules. Their children are considered adults and can no longer join them. So there's a 19-year-old boy in Calais in the jungle and a 20-year-old girl in Turkey. And she's done a video uh, to um, Theresa May, the Home Secretary of Britain, asking that she be allowed to be reunited with her children. And we need to support this demand. And I think this highlights the plight of refugees, and particularly children who are suffering the most. Uh, you know, it's untold stories. When the, you know, this time is over, when the media publicity and xenophobia sort of time is over, people on earth, the, the, actually the atrocities committed against the uh, refugees uh, who are trying to s seek sanctuary across Middle East, uh, in Turkey, and those who are trying to come to Europe, I think there will be a lot of untold stories. Yeah, and it's part of a campaign called Torn Apart that the Red Cross is organizing, uh, you know, showing the, the human reality of people being torn apart in this way. And of course that brings us to a final um, um, news item, which is a wonderful Save the Children video, a heartbreaking one of a British child, a young girl who is going through, you know, there's 30 second uh, clips of her going through this refugee process, being separated from her, her mother, you know, the horrors she goes through. And it's to remind us that there are um, two children every day, two refugee children every day who are drowning to death as a result of this movement that we see. And I think this is a brilliant piece of work. Um, every minute of the day we need to think about the refugees and the children who try to seek sanctuary and they deserve the most support we yeah, could give them. Yeah, uh, It's the lost generation that we need to save without any doubt.
A few weeks ago, when I was speaking at the Rationalist International Conference in Tallinn, Estonia, I met Emilia Eriksson there from the Swedish Humanist Association and heard her wonderful speech about the autonomy of children and their rights separate from their parents and their parents' religion. Listen to this wonderful interview from Emilia on this very issue. Thank you for uh, the interview. I wanted to ask you about something you were talking about at a recent Rationalist International Conference, and that is the rights of children and their autonomy from their parents. Can you explain that a little? Uh, yes. Um, I work primarily with, uh, within the Humanist Association with children's right to religious freedom. Uh, and it's uh, quite a delicate matter. Uh, because there is this um, assumption that uh, children are automatically given uh, the religion or the philosophy of life that, that the parents have and the family has. Uh, and according to the Children's Rights Convention and according to the discourse on children's rights, which I think is the correct um, way of viewing uh, the child, uh, then the children has a say in the matter and shouldn't automatically be given uh, the religion of the parents. You wouldn't say that, you know, this is a socialist child because the parents are socialists or this is a liberal child because the parents are liberals. And the same should go for religion, although it's more, it's somewhat more complicated, but I think that should be, um, be how you view it. Why is it more complicated? Maybe I can ask you that first. Hmm. Well, it is more complicated because for a lot of people, religion uh, is such a personal, intrinsic part of your... Uh, it's almost like a part of your DNA, um, which I can understand. Um, that uh, if you can't pass that on to your children, it's like not passing on a piece of yourself. And perhaps uh, a political standpoint isn't necessarily uh, as much part of your being. Uh, at least that's how I think a lot of people view it. Even the non-religious people has this, um, um, I don't know, this view of religion that it's something different from any other philosophy of life. Do you think it's not then a violation of uh, the parents' religious freedoms not to be able to pass this on to their mm -hmm. children? Uh, I think you, sh you should absolutely be able to pass your philosophy of life on in, in, in discussing what you believe in, but in respect of the child's right, it should be in a manner that uh, is very clear on the fact that, well, this is my view, but I will love you no matter what you choose. As long as it's um, in that kind of a respectful environment, of course you should be able to pass your, your ideas on. Uh, but you should also allow the freedom to choose for your children. I suppose, I mean, it, it is this perspective that children belong, in a sense, mm. are sort of property of their parents to an extent. I know things have moved on in some societies at least, but uh, with regards to women, for example, but mm. with children, I think it's still very much there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I would say it's the same in almost all societies, that uh, there's this parental right. It's like the parent's right to the child, but with a child's perspective or a children's rights perspective, it, it is really the child's right to its parents. Uh, I mean, a child should be with its parents if the parents are treating them well. The child shouldn't be with the parent, uh, regardless of how they are treated. You know, they have right to be treated well and respectfully, uh, regardless if it's the parents or if it's in school or any other adults that they meet. I mean, what what would you say are some of the key things that need to be done in order to respect children's rights, to belief, to autonomy, and so on and so forth? Well, the four or five main things that are necessary? I think we should have a school for children that is um, providing uh, an environment that is diverse, where children get to meet kids from other cultures um, with different backgrounds, where children are taught critical thinking, 
uh, because if you at least give kids that, uh, they have a bigger chance to be able to form their own opinion and, and perhaps um, um, criticize uh, their parents' beliefs if they, if, if they want to, then, then they're equipped. So that's one major, major thing. And then, of course, uh, respecting the Children's Rights Convention and to view it uh, as the child's right um, and, uh, and not as a way to strengthen parental control. Yeah. About the convention, if you know, have, have most countries signed the convention? Uh, what mm. are the ways to strengthen that sort of the implementation of the convention? Mm. Yeah, uh, I think all countries now uh, accept the US, uh, but the thing with international law is that it's, uh, it's really um, 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 a work of, uh, conventions are compromises. Uh, in, in order to get a lot of states to sign on to a convention, you need to compromise. So um, a way to strengthen convention is to, uh, to, I guess, not allow compromises, not allow people to uh, 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 sign on to it if they don't want to follow it but then again if not a lot of states sign on what does it matter so international law is really tricky that way but I think you should have respect for the child's right um, and um, uh, I think the only way to strengthen that is uh, to be brave enough to talk about it and debate it and question whenever the child's rights are violated. I mean, what would you say to parents, just let's say parents in Iran mm. or uh, even in Europe but also in the Middle East, North Africa, people who are watching this program possibly, what are some of the things they can do despite the outside environment which may be very anti-child, anti-human, mm. what are some of the things that parents can do in order to ensure that the child's right is respected well? Hmm. Well, I think key is to to have a home environment that is um, open and that is um, um, welcoming to to different ideas. Uh, and parents need to show that it's okay to criticize me. Like I can handle it. It's okay to tell me what you think, and I respect you for telling telling me what you think. If kids are feel that honesty and feel um, that welcoming environment from parents, I think they will be equipped to handle the outside world much better. Um, so if, they f if children grow up in a home where they feel loved, no matter if they choose the path of their parents or not, uh, I think that's the best gift parents can give their children. What do you say to people who say, well, we all grew up in as labeled as religious children, and we turned out okay. I mean, it's, it, is it really that serious of an issue that needs to be worked on and campaigned on? Uh, well, yeah, if you take children's rights to religious freedom seriously, then yes. And it's easy to say that uh, in retrospect or whatever, um, but um, uh, there are a lot of uh, people growing up that, that doesn't come forward and doesn't say that, you know, uh, I wish I, I had a choice. Uh, and there's a, if you're indoctrinated, do you really know what could have been? Do you have the critical thinking in place to even question the beliefs that someone gave you, basically? Why are you in this line of work? What interested you in this uh, in insurance rights issues? Why I'm in yeah did, did something interest you in particular that made you take this avenue for it? Yeah, because I th I believe that Article Fourteen of the of the Children's Rights Convention is the weakest one in the convention, because uh, most states have reservations against it, which makes it pretty weak. Uh, and it's also the article in the convention that even secularists question. Uh, that they don't really want to touch because what if you offend someone I don't want to offend anyone um, and so I think that sparked my interest like if I'm gonna work with children's rights I want to work with the right that that is really 
difficult to work with and that it's really in debates it's still in the dark ages really and you need to you need to help it so that's really what made me want to work on it great thank you very yeah, much thank you I hope you enjoyed that interview with Amelia Erickson. I think she raises some really important points. Points that, as she says, we're not really addressing as fundamentally as we should as a whole in, amongst secular organizations, humanist organizations. It is something that still people feel, like she was saying, uncomfortable about, you know, this fact of how, how autonomous should children be when it comes to their parents' beliefs? Don't parents have certain rights over their children? And I like the way she phrases it, that no, children are the ones who should have a right to their parents and safe parents, you know. Yes, and I think, I mean, if you compare it to recognition of the fact that women are, um, all religions are against women, and, uh, you know, the, the, the atrocities or the discrimination against women is clearly recognized, although there's a lot of problem that needs to be resolved and fought for, but the rights of children uh, is not as recognized across the board and many uh, aspects, and she refers to United Nations Convention on the Rights of Children and she refers to its weakness. Mm -hmm. and I think this recognition is part and parcel of fundamental human rights of, of children, the recognition of their right Mm. not parents right yeah. now. And particularly when you think about how vulnerable children are and how much more protection they need than adults, you know, and, and that's something that we really do need to uh, pay more attention to. So I think, um, you know, the work she's doing is fabulous and we should be doing more of that work across the board in every country where we have uh, secular activists, which is everywhere basically. The insane, insane fatwa of this week is from Moltaqa Ahl al-Hadith. And uh, they've basically said that emoticons are haram. I mean, this is what we were waiting for because emoticons. I, when I, whenever I looked at emoticons, I knew there was something so really wrong this, about The smile, the <laughs> sad, they wrong. give you thumbs up, that's not, this, this is not this good. Off. Now, if you think that this is a ridiculous fatwa, which you might, I would suggest that you listen to the rationality, rationalism, the rationale behind this fatwa, because then it will become very clear to you why you yeah. should also agree with the yeah, fact that it's yeah, haram. Yeah, there's no doubt. I've, I've there's no doubt. Earlier, it says, and I thought this is great look, reasoning. Emoticons are haram because they are imitating Allah's creatures. Since I didn't realize Allah created emoticons. It, well, no, he's, emo he's created creatures, I and emoticons see. are. And since picture Imitation. is the face, and the face is what makes the real picture, then emoticons, which represent the face, that expresses emotions, then all that adds up and makes them haram. I mean, it's just brilliant. It's brilliant. haram. It's haram. It's so, you've heard it from here. You've heard the rationality behind it. Don't do emoticons. It's just... Bad, forbidden, completely. Stupid fat <laughs> The slice of life this week is from Iran. It is about a Baha'i political prisoner. Her name is Fariba Kamal Abadi. Now, she was sentenced to 20 years in prison because she's a Baha'i. She spent the last eight years in prison. And when her daughter was uh, getting married, uh, she asked for permission to go and see the wedding, attend the wedding. And of course, she was denied by the Iranian authorities. So what's happened is that um, she's come out now for um, a few days furlough, uh, I think, to see her grandchild. And um, in, at, at this party, there's this video of them at a party celebrating the fact that she's come out for a few days. 
And there are other political prisoners there, and one of them is recounting the fact that when her daughter was getting married and she wasn't able to go, they had a mock wedding in the prison. So one of the prisoners pretended she was the groom, another pretended she was the bride, and they had wrapped in newspapers things that they had in the prison, a piece of bread, uh, a fork, uh, you know, a cutlery, and they had a whole ceremony uh, to celebrate wedding. her daughter's wedding because she couldn't go to it. And it's just such a and beautiful, beautiful story. And, and, and the important thing is because Baha'is from the Islamic point of view, they are outcast. And actually the fact of being Baha'i automatically, uh, you condemn to death and annihilation. And that's the important thing that the prisoners in the solidarity have come together and celebrated her daughter's wedding in prison. And that's beautiful. Yeah, it is really, really a beautiful story, especially um, in the video they talk about the person who's recounting this tells her that she loves uh, Fariba. And uh, the fact of the matter is that they come from different backgrounds and because there's this enmity against Baha'is that's perpetrated by the Iranian regime, what's very clear is that there's lots of people who don't agree with it. And this is a really beautiful form of resistance and human solidarity. So I think this is a gorgeous slice of life for this week. Um, unfortunately, though, you know, uh, Faiba is going to have to go back to prison. She has another 12 years of prison because she's because a she's a Baha'i. Baha she's a different religion. It's outra outrageous, outrageous. Anyway, we hope you've enjoyed this week's program. Uh, we've got a short special program next week. I hope you enjoy this one and the week after. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Until then, have a wonderful week. Bye. Goodbye. Hi, I'm Ariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to our year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discussed taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.